honor to introduce our next speaker, two o'clock keynote, Dr. Peter Kozlowski, who is visiting us now from Utah. author of a fantastic book on Fuck Your Gut. If you don't have it yet, please make sure to stop by afterwards and get a copy. He will autograph it for you. Maybe you can even take a selfie with him. He does have Instagram presence, so there will be hashtags available. Uh, and now I, I will introduce him in Polish. Szanowni, szanowni Państwo, Panie i Panowie, Pan Dr. Peter Piotr Kozłowski jest polsko-amerykańskim lekarzem z korzeniami tutaj właśnie w okolicach Chicago, którego mama też jest lekarzem, ale on tutaj dzisiaj dla nas będzie mówił na temat, dlaczego zdrowie zaczyna się od wieku. Pan doktor Kozłowski jest autorem cudownej książki właśnie o tym samym tytule Zdrowie zaczyna się od wieku po angielsku Antwarkirka. Opowie nam dzisiaj dużo więcej na ten temat. Zachęcamy Państwa do zakupu tej książki. To będzie można zrobić po jego prezentacji, po pytaniach i odpowiedziach. Prezentacja będzie w języku angielskim, ale może zadać pytania w języku polskim jak najbardziej. I oczywiście będą autografy też w języku polskim. Także witamy serdecznie doktora Kozłowskiego. Dzień dobry. Mój polski nie jest za dobry, to ja będę po angielsku mówił. My name is Dr. Peter Kozlowski. Um, I was trained as a family practice doctor and I was introduced to something called functional medicine, which is a different way to look at health, a way to figure out why someone's sick. So as a regular doctor, I was trained to listen to your symptoms and then figure out what pill to give you for you to feel better. As a functional medicine doctor, I was taught to listen to you and to figure out why you're sick. And from the beginning, I was taught gut health, start with the gut, start with the gut, start with the gut. So when I started practicing 10 years ago, that's what I did. I, I started, started with the gut. And people come to me with eczema or a family of an autistic child or rheumatoid arthritis, and they look at me like I'm crazy because why am I talking about the gut? So, but that, in my experience, is where disease begins. So that's what I'm here to teach you guys about, um, how the gut works, and why it's so important, and then what you can do to test and treat it. So Hippocrates said it 3,000 years ago, all disease begins in the gut. And it's incredible that he knew that so long ago. And I think it's even more incredible that since he said that, everything we've done is damage our guts. So through antibiotics, through medications, through stress, through what they've done to our food supply, we have destroyed our guts. And now you see chronic disease skyrocketing, whether you talk about autism or dementia or autoimmune <coughs> disease. And the one thing that's happened is, is we've, like I said, we've really destroyed our guts. So um, we're going to start with the anatomy. Um, so the gut is the tube that starts with the mouth and ends with the anus. It is a long tube made of the mouth, esophagus, stomach, small intestine, large intestine, and then your pancreas, liver, and gallbladder are all attached to the small intestine. So what people tend to think of with the gut is digestion and absorption, right? We eat food, we break it down, and then we absorb the nutrients into our body. The most important thing that I like to teach people about the gut is the inside of your gut tube is considered outside of your body. So what that means is if you swallow something and you poop it out, it's never been in your body. And so a lot of people have heard of that term leaky gut. And so we're going to explain what that is. But basically the reason Hippocrates said it is because the gut is the way that the outside environment gets into our bodies. On the other side, of this tube is the bloodstream. So the gut's most important job is to decide what comes in and what stays out. And again, due to everything in our society, the food and the, all of it, we are exposed to so many more toxins and that stuff gets into our bodies and then once it's in our bodies, it can go anywhere. So my passion and what my patients hate hearing me talk about is the gut-brain connection. When people come to see me, they want the diet, they want a diet, they want supplements, they want the right tests. 
But when I talk to them about their mental, emotional, and spiritual health, they basically tell me, forget it. Like, that's not why I'm here. That's definitely not a problem for me. It is, it's a problem for pretty much everybody I work with, and it's the most difficult part of healing the gut, but it is the most important. So I'm gonna show you why, what is the gut-brain connection and why it's so important. So they call it first brain, second brain. Your, that gut tube that you have is surrounded by its own nervous system called the enteric nervous system. The enteric nervous system has more neurons than your brain does. Your enteric nervous system maintains your intestinal barrier, so that means protects you against leaky gut. It regulates your immune response. It detects nutrients, influences motility and circulation. The key, and what I say is the key to your gut health, is your vagus nerve. You have 12 cranial nerves, and one of them, number 10, is called the vagus nerve. The vagus nerve runs from your brain to your gut. It carries signals in both directions. So the brain sends information to the gut, the gut sends information to the brain. The vagus nerve works on what is called your autonomic nervous system, which means automatic. Your autonomic nervous system developed over evolution to help people survive because it either activates a sympathetic response or a parasympathetic response. <coughs> sympathetic is fight or flight. And now that I live in Montana, the analogy that I use is you're hiking in the mountains and you see a grizzly bear, sympathetic nervous system is activated, the energy goes to your brain and to your muscles to survive. Very important adaptive strategy, that's why people have survived. If you do survive and you're sitting by the campfire having s'mores, you're in parasympathetic response, you're relaxed. The energy is going to your brain, or excuse me, the energy is going to your gut to break down the food. So both responses are important, the problem that we're dealing with nowadays, especially over the last two years, is people are living as if they're running from a bear 24-7. We wake up and the first thing we do is check our phones, and right away we're in survival mode. There's wars, there's breaking news, there's social media, you gotta reply to text, calls right away. And so the mind starts the day by telling the gut, we don't need you today, it's a survival day. And when that system's activated, digestion stops your gut becomes leaky, your microbiome becomes imbalanced, and we're gonna look at that. And a condition called SIBO can develop. So when the parasympathetic is activated, that is when you digest, that's when you release stomach acid, that's when your gut barrier stays nice and tight and it helps you keep a healthy microbiome. So that's what we have to get out of, is that sympathetic response. And most people, don't know they're in it or they deny it, right? And in my experience, it typically starts as trauma. And the definition of trauma that I use, most people think of trauma as like war or violence. Trauma, the best definition I've heard, is anything less than nurturing. So it could be as simple as your parents not paying enough attention to you. That sets off a signal of I'm not good enough, you're five years old, that shuts down your gut, you end up in my office when you're 40 years old with Hashimoto's. And it all started with the mental, emotional, spiritual part. Um, it's very hard work. I, I struggle with it every day, but it's the best work that I've done. Um, this is a joke I like to use, but what happens in the Vegas, what happens in Vegas doesn't stay in Vegas. So your Vegas nerve carries <laughs> signals in, in, in both directions. The key to your gut health, not what people are expecting to hear, but it's healing trauma. It's staying in the present moment. It's working with a therapist, exercise, sleep, prayer, meditation. Those are the real keys to healing your gut. The rest of this stuff is easy. We have good testing, we have good treatment plans, but the number one thing that I see get in the way of people healing is, is that they don't focus on this. So now we're gonna get through the different parts of the gut. The first part, food drops down the esophagus into the stomach. The stomach is where you make hydrochloric acid. That is how digestion starts. It is responsible for protein digestion, 
activating digestive enzymes, killing off bacteria, and absorbing minerals. So if any of you have had gut issues and you've gone to your regular doctor or even a GI doctor, the first medication they always want to put you on is an acid-blocking drug. We take the polar opposite approach in functional medicine. When I have somebody come into me on an acid-blocking drug, that is the first thing that we're doing is getting off of it. Because when you block acid, you block all of these functions. So the rest of your gut falls apart. Symptoms of low stomach acid. They look like the symptoms of too much stomach acid. Why does it happen? It's a normal part of aging. 80% of people over 80 have low stomach acid. I see it in teenagers now, and young adults, um, and just people of all ages. And why? Because of the gut-brain connection, because of that sympathetic nervous system. Your brain is telling your gut, now is not the time to digest, so you're not gonna make stomach acid. Diseases that happen when you have low stomach acid for a long time are immune disorders and thyroid disorder. Why is that? Because your immune system and thyroid are most dependent on vitamins and minerals to function. Your thyroid needs zinc and selenium and iodine and iron, um, as do your immune system. Well, even if you have the healthiest diet in the world, if you're not digesting the food, you're not going to absorb the nutrients. And over time, the thyroid goes wrong, the immune system goes wrong. How can you test yourself? So this is a test that you can do at home. It's called the baking soda test. When I first heard it, it sounded completely ridiculous to me. It, it, it sounded like a little kid's uh, volcano chemistry experiment of making a volcano blow up. And so I, at first I was like, is this really a reliable test? But I've used this test for many years now with good accuracy. So what you do is, you have to do it first thing in the morning, but mix a quarter teaspoon of baking soda into a few ounces of water, mix it up and drink it. The baking soda is basic. Your stomach should be acidic. When a base and an acid meet, it creates an explosion, which presents as gas, and you should start burping. If you don't burp within three to five minutes, then you probably have low stomach acid. How do you treat it? Through healing trauma, through working on the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous systems, getting out of that fight or flight. While you're doing that, we use supplementation. So we use a hydrochloric acid supplement. It comes in capsules. The most important things to know about it is it should only be taken before eating protein. Meat, fish, eggs, if you're just eating a, a bunch of vegetables, you're probably not going to need it because stomach acid is for protein digestion. So before a protein-containing meal, you take one capsule and then you eat. Somebody with normal stomach acid is going to feel it. You're going to feel reflux. You're going to feel too much acid. That's because you dropped in acid, your stomach's making acid, and there's too much and it burns. Somebody with low stomach acid is either going to feel better or not feel it at all. It'll feel like you took a vitamin D capsule or something. That means you have low stomach acid. And then what you do is figure out how deficient you are. You increase your dose every two days from one to two, two to three, all the way up to seven. At some point, let's say you get to three, you feel some reflux. That means that your dose is two. And you stay on that as long as you need to. The way you know you don't need it anymore is when your dose, if your dose was two and then all of a sudden one day you take two and you feel some discomfort. That's a sign your stomach is starting to make acid again on its own. Um, so this is all, uh, I list this all in my book. There's the step-by-step -step protocol, how to do this. Um, it's a very, very important part. If, if digestion doesn't work, the rest of your gut's not gonna work. And I also, if anybody is on an acid-blocking drug, I also give a treatment plan of how to get off of it in my book. So from the stomach, we move into the small intestine, this purple area. The small intestine is about 20 feet long, and this is where the majority of digestion occurs. 
Food and acid pass from your stomach and into the small intestine. Once they're in there, the pancreas releases enzymes that help you break down fats, carbs, and sugars. Your liver makes bile. Bile is stored in your gallbladder. Bile goes into the small intestine and helps you break down fat. Even if you're making pancreatic enzymes, if there's not acid coming into the small intestine, your pancreatic enzymes will not get activated. So you are going to not digest your food, and you're going to end up with nutrient deficiencies. <coughs> The small intestine is also where absorption occurs. So 90% of our nutrients are absorbed in the small intestine. There's 2,000 square feet of absorptive surface. It's a huge area. How does a 20-foot small intestine turn into 2,000 square feet? Microvilla. That's what your small intestine should look like. You're, you're, that's what increases the surface area, and that's how you absorb. So again, the inside of your gut is outside of your body. In the small, and starting in the stomach and then the small intestine, you've digested things, and then the nutrients cross through the microvilli and into your blood. Now they're in your body. These are your different vitamins and minerals and where they move from the gut tube and into the blood. It's basically all happening in the small intestine. So the majority of absorption is happening there. This is also where the famous term leaky gut happens. Have you guys heard of leaky gut? Yes. Okay. That's all we can do. All right, let's talk about leaky gut. Um, <laughs> um, so food, toxins, everything that we're being exposed to is passing through your gut. And a healthy gut is going to let nutrients in and keep the toxins out. In inflamed gut, your gut barrier is lost. And anything that is passing through your gut can get into your blood. It is now in your body. What is waiting in your bloodstream? Your immune system. Your immune system is patrolling the blood and deciding what is safe and what is bad. When the immune system identifies an invader, it attacks. When it does that, that creates inflammation. Where's the inflammation? In your blood, inside your body. What happens with the blood? It goes everywhere, from your head to your toes. So that's why when I'm working with patients, and whether we're talking about gluten sensitivities, or candida, or dysbiosis, or SIBO, every person I work with could have totally different symptoms. And this, this is the key as to why Hippocrates said all disease begins in the gut. Because the bad stuff gets through, and then it's free game to go anywhere. And one person could have migraines, the next person could have Hashimoto's. And it all started with a broken gut barrier. That's a microscopic picture of a leaky gut. So very different. What causes a leaky gut? <coughs> Our standard American diet, as we call it, the SAD diet. Um, stress is the number one reason why it's happening. Uh, medications, uh, antibiotics, um, acid blockers, environmental toxins like lead, mercury, mold, those are other things that we work with. Having low stomach acid, having an imbalanced microbiome. So one appro the approach that I take to leaky gut is treat the underlying cause. There's a lot of practitioners in my field that will put people on these supplement regimens for leaky gut, and I do use supplements sometimes, but that's very much a traditional medicine model approach. It's masking the symptoms with a supplement instead of a medication. So the real way to heal leaky gut is to work on these underlying issues, and that's what we take people through in functional medicine. The last part is the large intestine, and that's what I joke is my favorite area because that's where your microbiome lives. The three to five pounds of bacteria that are growing inside of you live on the inside of your large intestine. And so that's what we're going to talk about, your microbiome. This is a comic, but this is what your large intestine should look like. It is full of bacteria. 
the, the generic term that people use for those good bacteria is probiotics. That's why people take probiotics is to try to grow more good bacteria. So why do we talk about the microbiome? Why does it matter? Um, the, the first thing to understand about your microbiome is it is, a, it is alive. Your gut bacteria need to eat to stay alive, just like we do. What do they eat? What's their favorite foods? Fiber. Fiber and good sugars. We, in standard American diet, do not eat enough fiber. Even if you look at like the United States Preventative Task Force, they tell men to, to eat 25 grams of fiber and women to eat 15 grams of fiber. In functional medicine, you'll hear people tell 60 grams of fiber a day up to 100 grams of fiber. That is to feed your microbiome. And so that, that's a, an important part is not, you know, through eating at McDonald's and Burger King and Portillo's, there's no food for the microbiome and the gut bacteria die. And once they start dying, the wrong bugs will start taking over. And that's what we'll look at too. So we as humans, we have about 23,000 genes. There's studies that have, they've found over 22 million bacterial genes in your gut. They talk to us. The gut bacteria are constantly influencing us. They affect the way your bones grow, the way your immune system functions, the way your brain functions, your arteries, your skin, um, and your weight. So I always say your skin is your best representation of your gut. Right? It is your largest organ, and when inflammation is getting into the body through the gut, it loves to go to the skin. Um, so we're going to talk about how you get a microbiome, and then how you can screw it up. A microbiome starts during a vaginal birth. The vaginal canal is lined with probiotics. The infant picks up good bacteria as it passes through the canal. One out of every three children nowadays are born by C-section. When you're born by C-section, you go straight out of the belly into the nurse's gloves. They've done stool analysis on babies that were born by C-section, and they find the same bacteria that was on the delivery nurse's gloves growing in the baby's gut. And that's one out of every three people. And then if you factor in all women are tested for group B strep before delivery, if you test positive, they put you on antibiotics. When you go on antibiotics, that kills your flora. You cannot then transfer them to your baby. Um, after that, it's breast milk. The most important thing about breast milk is that it's full of pre and probiotics. The actual bacteria and the food for the bacteria. So we went through a huge period of formula feeding. Formula. The, your, the infant is not getting probiotics. So breast milk is crucial for your microbiome to develop. And then after that, it's our diet. It's the type of foods that we eat that determine how our microbiome grows. How does our microbiome get screwed up? I would say the number one reason is probably antibiotics and, and how prevalent, prevalently <coughs> antibiotics have been prescribed. What is an antibiotic? It is a tablet or capsule that was designed to kill bacteria. Where do we put it? In a tube that has five pounds of bacteria. Taking antibiotics just once ever in your life can wipe out half of your good bacteria. So, and you think about how many people have been on antibiotics and how frequently. Stress. I can see how stressed out someone is on a stool analysis. So one of the ways we'll look at how you look at someone's microbiome is by stool testing. And on the stool, I can see specific probiotics that will not grow due to stress. Um, our diets and then other medications are some of the top ways that our microbiome gets screwed up. The analogy that I really like to use is thinking of your microbiome like your own garden. <coughs> and in that analogy, the probiotics are the plants of your garden. Fiber is the fertilizer of your garden. What happens in your garden at home if you don't take care of it? 
weeds grow. That's what happens in our guts. That is called dysbiosis, when the wrong bacteria are overgrowing your gut. And these are things that you guys have heard of, yeast like candida, bacteria like clostridia, but there's millions of bacteria that we find that could be pathogenic in the gut, parasites, um, any kind of basically, these, these are weeds that are overgrowing. These are not probiotics. These are weeds that are releasing toxins. So dysbiosis, what happens is that sends toxins into the bloodstream. And we learn what happens once something gets into the bloodstream. It goes anywhere. So your immune system, when it sees these toxins from these bacteria, your immune system's trying to defend you. And when it's defending you, that's creating inflammation. And it's spreading anywhere. Diseases that are associated with the wrong bacteria are anything, if you believe in the gut. So it, it can be any kind of chronic disease, whether it's an autoimmune disease, like Hashimoto's or ulcerative colitis, depression, rheumatoid arthritis, um, your weight, autism. It, it, the list goes on and on for diseases that can happen due to an imbalanced microbiome. The last part that I want to talk about, this is the most common condition that I treat when people come to me. It is called SIBO which stands for small intestine bacterial overgrowth. What happens is, is your microbiome has migrated into your small intestine. And you guys just learned your small intestine is where you should be digesting and absorbing. Your small intestine should not be covered in bacteria. It does not matter if the bacteria are good or bad. If they've overgrown your small intestine, um, it is a big problem. And whenever you eat, they eat. And when, when our gut bacteria eat, it is an anaerobic process, which means without oxygen. So gas is created. So if you eat a bunch of fiber and you get gassy, that's your gut bacteria eating. That's a great thing if your microbiome is healthy. That is a disaster for someone who has bacteria overgrowing their small intestine. And this is the most common condition that I see. This is now what your small intestine looks like. Small intestine bacterial overgrowth, SIBO symptoms. So you have the, the kind of classic ones that you would think of, like bloating, belching, gas, pain, constipation, nausea. That's, you know, when somebody comes in with those symptoms, you're really thinking SIBO. But what I've seen over the years now is people that don't have any gut symptoms, but they have eczema or mood symptoms or brain fog or fatigue or joint pain, and we test them for SIBO, it comes back positive, we treat the SIBO and the skin clears up, or the joints feel better, or the brain fog goes away. <laughs> and again, most people don't, again, it, it sounds kind of weird if you don't understand the gut, and that's kind of why I've made it my passion to teach people about why the gut is so important, um, because it really can present as anything. This, these, and, and if so, if you've heard of SIBO, you may have heard of FODMAPs. FODMAPs are highly fermentable foods. They are our gut bacteria's favorite foods. These are great foods if your small, if your gut is healthy, if your gut is overgrown, if your small intestine is overgrown with bacteria, these foods are going to make you symptomatic. So when somebody comes in to see me and they tell me they're reacting to avocados or onions or garlic or almonds or apples or dairy, the first thing I'm thinking is SIBO. Why does SIBO happen? The same reasons that the rest of the gut goes wrong. In my opinion, it starts with most people as stress, which leads to low stomach acid, which leads to SIBO. An example that I have is every single person that's ever come to my office who had a history of being on an acid-blocking drug for more than three months has tested positive for SIBO. 
And it, but the problem is, is that we're inducing low stomach acid just through stress. So it's not just the medications. Um, chronic constipation, toxins, diet, meds, all of these things can trigger SIBO. I, I've heard a number of times somebody taking a course of antibiotics and then their gut's never the same. And we test them and they have SIBO. The last part that I want to talk about is the testing. So when someone comes in to see me, how do we look at this stuff? How do we find out what is going on in the gut? The first test that I will do is what's called a comprehensive stool analysis. It is a poop test. And it tells us what is growing in your garden. This page that you're looking at is a picture basically telling you what plants are in your garden and what weeds are in your garden. We look for pathogenic bacteria, imbalanced bacteria, yeasts like candida, and if those things are overgrowing your microbiome, we're going to treat them. We, th this, is the, the, this test continued, and so there's more bacteria that we look at, and then there's this very long list of parasites that we test you for, because Someone with a dysbiosis situation, you can frequently have multiple things going on. So that person might have parasites and they might have candida, or somebody might have SIBO and dysbiosis. So the things do not happen independently. You can have more than one thing going on at once, and we do find that frequently. This test also tells us how well is your pancreas working. So it looks at digestive function. It looks at inflammation. And it looks at short-chain fatty acids. Short-chain fatty acids are what your bacteria produce when they eat. When you have a healthy microbiome, you make lots of short-chain fatty acids. They've done the, the most known short-chain fatty acids, sorry, that's blurry, um, is called butyrate. There have been studies that have shown the higher your levels of butyrate, the lower your risk of dementia. And the really cool thing that this, the, this lab does is what's called sensitivity testing. So if they find pathogenic bacteria, they will treat the bacteria that are growing inside you with different herbs and different antibiotics to see what kills what's growing inside you. Most people are familiar now that antibiotic resistance is developing. I see resistance to herbs and antibiotics. Um, but when this test tells us, then it makes treatment easier um, because we know exactly how to get rid of what's overgrown in your gut. That is a full stool analysis. My second test that I will do that for somebody that wants a complete picture of their gut is called an organic acids test. It is called an OAT for short. This is a urine test. We are measuring different metabolites in the urine. The main reason I like to do this test for someone for their gut is to diagnose candida. So candida is a yeast that overgrows um, due to too much sugar, which can be caused by diet or stress. Um, we test for candida in the stool but candida frequently dies in the stool. So we get a lot of false negatives. So what this test does is look at the metabolites of candida. So if you're excreting a lot of metabolites in the urine of candida, that tells us you have a candida overgrowth. This, the next parts of these this test are not related to the gut, but they are related to other health markers that people are frequently interested in. So the next part of this test looks at your Krebs cycle. Your Krebs cycle happens in your mitochondria. Your mitochondria, they call them the powerhouse of your body. They're the powerhouse cells. That is where we take food and turn it into energy. Due to toxins, due to poor gut health, due to a poor diet, your mitochondria can get inflamed. And we can see that on this test. It also measures neurotransmitters like dopamine, norepinephrine, serotonin, and then these next two pages are a nutritional evaluation. It tells us how well your body is turning fat into energy. We, our body preferentially uses carbohydrates to make energy. That is because of um, how big carbohydrates are. So a carbohydrate is typically six carbons long. 
It's a chain of six carbons. Our body breaks that down and can quickly turn that into energy. Fats are typically 20 carbons or longer. They are much more difficult to turn into energy. That's why when you, if somebody's tried the keto diet and they tell you to use MCT oil, that is a short chain fatty acid that can quickly be turned into energy. Um, so we can see how well your body is doing that. Uh, B vitamins, vitamin C, CoQ10, NAC, biotin, glutathione, which is your body's master antioxidant, and then amino acid metabolites. So that is a full organic acid test. It tells us quite a bit about your body. The last test is SIBO testing. And to me, this is probably the most interesting and coolest test that they've come up with. This is a breath test. What we're measuring in your breath are hydrogen and methane gases. What did I tell you? Your gut bacteria are alive. When they eat, it's an anaerobic process which creates gas. What happens for a SIBO test is you drink this little solution of lactulose, which is a sugar and one of the favorite foods of the gut bacteria. After you drink this solution, you blow into a different tube every 20 minutes for two hours. In those first two hours, the lactulose is passing from your mouth, esophagus, stomach, and small intestine. Those parts of your gut should not have enough bacteria present to ferment the lactulose. These lines should be flat. This person, the lines are elevated. That tells us the microbiome has migrated up into the small intestine. It does not tell us whether those bacteria are good or bad. It doesn't matter. Even if there's probiotics overgrowing your small intestine, that could be causing you symptoms. If they're there, you need to get rid of them in order to heal your gut. So that, that's the end of my gut talk and, and introduction to gut. And my book that we have available, we just published it last year, is goes into much more depth on all of these subjects. Um, we give you um, elimination diet recipes. So one other thing that I'd, I'd like to talk about that I don't have slides on are food sensitivities. When your body reacts to food, there's three different kinds of reactions that can happen. You can have a food allergy, you can have celiac disease, and you can have a sensitivity. Most people are familiar with allergies and celiac disease. Why? Because those reactions happen right after you eat the food. So somebody doesn't make it to 30 years old without knowing that they're allergic to peanuts, right? You, you've gone into anaphylaxis already. Celiac disease is a specific response to gluten. That those people typically will have severe gut symptoms and skin symptoms. Food sensitivities are what I work with, what we work with. They are due to a different type of antibody. So allergies are due to IgE antibodies. Celiac is IgA antibodies. Sensitivities are IgG antibodies. Why is that important? Those are our chronic antibodies. They are, the reaction does not happen right after you eat the food. And that's what makes food sensitivities so dangerous, is because you could eat a bagel every day for breakfast, you're sensitive to gluten, you feel fine, you feel fine, you get to lunch and no problem, but you're dealing with chronic migraines, or you're dealing with chronic depression, or you've got eczema. Let's say you have eczema and migraines. You go to your doctor, you get a pill for all the migraines. You get a cream for the eczema. The pill for the migraines destroys your gut. So then you get on an acid blocker to, for the side effects of the migraine medicine. And then your gut's destroyed, you get depressed. And then you end up on an antidepressant. And just like that, you're on three meds before you even know it. And this is a very, very common story through traditional medicine. The whole time you're still eating that bagel every day for breakfast and your doctor never talked to you hey, maybe there's something you're eating that's the reason you started getting migraines and then all the medications I gave you are the reason you're depressed and have gut issues. That, that, that's not 
what a traditional doctor will tell you. Um, so we, it, I have an entire chapter in my book about how to diagnose food sensitivities. And one way that I differ with a lot of practitioners in my field is I do not recommend anyone to do food sensitivity panels. There are tests called food sensitivity tests where they can test you for 200 foods. Those tests can be extremely unreliable. They can typically just be a log of what you've been eating for the last two or three months. So if anybody's ever done one of those and you get back this list and it looks just like things that you're eating all the time, all that test is telling you is that you have leaky gut. It's not an actual reliable test for a food sensitivity. You diagnose a food sensitivity yourself through what is called an elimination diet. What an elimination diet is, you cut out the biggest offending foods for 21 days. And then you add them back in one by one using a tracking journal. And you monitor symptoms. My biggest question when I learned about elimination diet is why 21 days? To me it just sounded like a made up number. It is based on half-lives. Everything in your body has a half-life. Your hormones have half-lives. If you take prescription medications, they have a half-life. Lead and mercury have a half-life. The half-life is how long it takes us to clear half of that substance. So let's say I ate a bagel today for breakfast, and I have 100 antibodies against gluten floating around in my body right now. If I completely avoid gluten for the next 21 days, my immune response cuts in half to 50. On day 22, when I reintroduce the gluten, my immune system will remember, attack it, and there will be a rapid spike in antibodies, and I will get symptoms. Those symptoms can be anything. There's, you, you might start an elimination diet because you have migraines, but when you reintroduce gluten, your gut falls apart, or you have insomnia, um, or your skin breaks out. It doesn't matter what the reaction is. If there's a reaction, that is a food that you are probably sensitive to. So this is another thing that you guys can do before coming in to see someone like me is plan and do an elimination diet. It is not easy. Um, we have the full list of foods that we cut out, but they are gluten. The top six offenders are gluten, dairy, soy, corn, eggs sugar. They started with the hybridization of wheat 50 years ago and then it turned into the genetic modification of soy and corn. Over 90% of corn and over 90% of soy in America are genetically modified. What does that mean? The proteins are different. So the gluten protein or the soy protein doesn't look like it used to. So your immune system responds to that and attacks, and that creates a sensitivity. In a lot of ways, you can argue that that's a very appropriate response because you're putting in this substance that your body is not familiar with, that it is a genetically modified organism that looks different, so your immune system's trying to defend you. The problem is, is as it's defending you, you might be getting skin symptoms or gut symptoms or depression. Um, so. You cut out all the foods at once, and then you add them back in one by one using this tracking journal. So that's, I go through that thoroughly in my book, how to do the reintroduction, which foods to cut out, and then we have 50 recipes at the end. And the recipes, I've made them all, I did not write them. One of my patients wrote the recipes. A woman that I started working with seven years ago who came to me for rheumatoid arthritis has been off of medications, um, off of supplements, and in remission from rheumatoid arthritis for all these years, and it was all through an elimination diet. She was a, she is a chef by training, so when I started writing my book, I reached out to her. I was like, hey, can you write recipes for me? And she did, and, and they're really good. So that is there for you as well as a tool um, so through using my book, there's a lot of steps that you can take before coming in to see me. You can start an elimination diet. You can start assessing whether your digestion's working. You can start 
um, replacing the digestive substances. Um, so there's a lot of things you can get started on on your own. And then we, if that doesn't get you far, for a lot of people that's enough. They, they will heal through just those steps. But there's also a lot of people that don't, and that's when we start doing the testing. And we start figuring out um, what's going on. One of the things that uh, Jasmine, my assistant, actually noticed is we were, we were seeing the first step in functional medicine is, is always an elimination diet. It should always be an elimination diet if you've never done one. What we started seeing is people starting an elimination diet and they were getting worse. And that was very confusing to us. And what Jasmine figured out, or the idea she had was maybe they have SIBO. Because what happens when you start an elimination diet? You start eating way more fiber, which feeds your microbiome. So if, if you start an elimination diet and you start feeling worse, that's a very good marker that you have SIBO. So the, the other diet that we, we called the COS plan is an elimination diet that is also low FODMAP. Very difficult diet, but we give you the recipes and the instructions how to do it. Um, and so you have that in the book as well. So that's kind of the, the end of my spiel, and uh, I'm open to taking questions for anybody that has them. Sure. Uh, being here and sharing the knowledge, which is very important for all of us. So thank you very much. Yeah,